Thanks, everybody, for uh, joining us today for our uh, coach chat. Um, a few things, uh, a few few items of business before we turn it over to Randy. Um, for those of you who might not know, our second phase of the PJ disaster relief has opened. Um, I left a link and a little bit more information on that in the chat section. So feel free uh, during the call when uh, if you're interested uh, to check that out. Um, also saw that Junko was on the line. Um, Junko, not to put you on the spot here, wondered if you can give, I, I think there still might be a little bit of confusion as to uh, what the Junior League season is looking like. Um, yeah, for those of you who might not know, the postseason has been canceled, but we are still definitely uh, going to be running all of the recreational season. Um, Junko, would you mind just giving us a, a quick update um, in that respect? Sure, Anthony. Um, yeah, so just like Anthony mentioned, we did cancel all postseason events for PGA Junior League. Um, we just felt like that that was the right decision to uh, make, uh, considering everyone's safety first and foremost. But uh, we will be running our regular season or our local league play. So if you're not currently involved in PGA Junior League, um, I definitely encourage you to get more and please feel free to reach out to me and I'm happy to give you more information about that. I think there's once at your facilities and in your local authorities, it's uh, safe and healthy to run a program or a group program. It's a great opportunity here. So please feel free to reach out to me. And yeah, we're just slowly take everything day by day with currently registered captains just to see where everyone is at, at their golf courses, restrictions and guideline wise. And we're hoping to start some seasons, uh, some junior league seasons in probably July or August or so and then throughout the rest of the year. So definitely reach out to me if you'd like more information or if I can help in any way. Thanks. So, John, I got a question um, as far as the uh, parents that are already have paid for um, their league, the $75 league fees are asking about um, uh, refunds. Yep. So if there's any parents or families asking for a refund currently, um, as long as you have not ordered your team kits, we can offer a full refund. Once the team kits ship, um, that $75 uh, fee is no longer refundable. And, and do they go through that uh, through the website or, or do the captains need to do that? Yep. So the families can go through the Junior League website. There's a little chat box on the bottom right hand corner um, of the website and uh, it's like a live chat basically. So parents or captains can of course request refunds through that. But if I can help, obviously just send me the players, the captains can send me the players names and I can submit the request as well. Thank you, Junko. Another thing is because we're still planning to 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 run uh, almost like uh, our own little leagues between our, ourselves. So anybody out there, uh, as soon as our golf courses were cleared to be able to do so, uh, we're we're still contacting captain to captain uh, to run these uh, matches anyway. So uh, those of you out there. Um, you may be getting you know, calls or, or call some of the other captains that are in your area to continue to, uh, to just run matches, whether home and homes or, or, or what have you. Yeah, there's a there's again, like Randy mentioned, there's a huge opportunity. Um, we're disappointed that we had to cancel postseason. But when we have postseason, there's a lot of different um, rules or elig postseason eligibility um rules that we have to abide by but since postseason is no longer um going on or we're moving forward with that uh there's a lot of flexibility so even if you have typically been in a league with xyz facility feel free to reach out to other other teams um and try to set up some games with them whether it's one home one away match or just you know however way you'd like to set that up um again a lot of flexibility or do your own in-house league as well, which is we are encouraging to do as we feel that that will be the safest because that eliminates the travel aspect of junior league. Um, and before I forget, I'm sorry, Randy and Anthony, we will be releasing some guidelines and recommendations uh, that is junior league specific. Um, hopefully before the 1st of June, we are getting this uh, approved by the CDC. So anyone looking to run any type of junior programming or at least PGA junior league, 
um, feel free to check that out once it's released because um, we'll give you some recommendations on how to run the season when you get started. Grab me a indoor plate. And uh, just just lastly, uh, uh, Tom had had written in the chat there. Um, looks like uh, golf instruction is now open in all of our counties, which is a really great thing. So um, thanks to Tom and Nikki and Jeff um, for kind of going to bat on our behalf um, with the local mun municipalities, um, as well as working with our partner um, partners at the SCGA. So. Um, Great, great announcement last week. And uh, Randy, on that note, we'll, we'll turn it over um, for you. All right, thank, thanks, Anthony, uh, Nikki, Junko, everybody at uh, the SCPGA for uh, the communication through all this time. It's great uh, that uh, we're starting to get back. And it's important that um, we hold to those guidelines when we are back. Uh, unlike a lot of the pictures that we saw this past weekend, uh, that's the best way for us to possibly get shut back down again. So uh, everybody that is getting back to work, uh, let's hold to those guidelines so it doesn't, again, have that uh, look. Uh, I'm, I'm really excited and happy that um, our featured speaker, uh, Derek Ueda uh, is on with us. Um, as everybody probably already knows, you know, he's a, a former Southern California Teacher of the Year, SCPGA Teaching Hall of Famer. Um, he, he's been teach teaching a while and has taught a lot, a lot of great players, uh, especially you know, as far as Xander um, Shoffley, who's again one, one of our own juniors that has, that has come about. Uh, through the ranks and thanks to Derek and what he's done with, with his putting. So uh, again, I'd like to welcome uh, Derek uh, Ueda. He's at the Grand Del Mar and, uh, and welcome Derek. Thanks. Thanks. Good to be here. Um, yeah. I appreciate you guys having me on. No, I appreciate it. And all you've done in, in our section. Um, so kind of a, a few things that, that I'd like to talk about today. Uh, obviously, uh, what you did for, for Xander um, and, and his putting that has gotten to where he's at, you know, that's kind of made you kind of like the guru now of, uh, of, of putting. You know, as you've gone through your teaching career, because because I've known, I've known you for, for a while, know you've been around teaching uh, with what has happened to Xander. Have you kind of niched yourself in kind of the putting realm, kind of like, you know, a Dave Pels or, or uh, uh, Dave Stockton kind of thing? You're getting a lot of people uh, now – phone calling you about, uh, hey, help my putting? Yeah, it's funny because um, Xander is the one that pigeonholed me into this kind of, um, you know, Carl Welty is my mentor, and I would be remiss if I didn't mention his name. I wouldn't be anywhere without him. I mean, um, Doug Timmons knows, you know, I, I spent a lot, a lot of time with Carl and just kind of learning how to, you know, get video, um, study it and look after it. And for a long time, I was a, I was a full swing guy. Like I yeah. had all this video and we didn't have force plates and we didn't have, um, 3d and we didn't have AMM or gears or any of that stuff that we have now, um, that we use. Um, but yeah, to answer your question, it's kind of, it's, it's, I'm probably doing 65 to 70% putting stuff and probably 30% you know, short game, pitching, chipping around the greens and, and full swing. Mm -hmm. um, and then I'm doing some course management type stuff. Some people will call in and say, hey, you know, I hear you talking about how Xander attacks golf courses and how Charlie attacks golf courses. And just curious as to, to you know, what they're thinking about and how they, they, they go about doing it. So, but yeah. yeah, to answer your question, it's a lot of putting now. Um, and, and as you've gone through, uh, you know, this, this, this process that you have, uh, I, I, what I've seen in being able to talk and be around even myself, you know, there is a process, whether I'm 
going to be teaching a tour player or that beginning average golfer. You know, we listen to to Jamie Jamie Mulligan a lot, and he has his wheel. You know, and and whether yeah. you're you're a beginner or you're a tour player, you know, he starts with this his wheel and his spokes. Do you have a process as such, uh, or do you treat it differently from uh, a tour player to the average golfer that most of us actually teach? Yeah, you know what's funny is um, I start the same way. You know, when I started with Xander, um, he was really bad at reading greens. Like he would have a very obvious right to left putt that any of us would look at it and go, that is a ball outside right. No, no chance about it. And he did literally have it going the other way. <laughs> and I was shocked. Like I was shocked. Here he is in college. He's, you know, a really good player in college. He's shooting under par. He was, he was on the watch list for the Walker cup. I mean, he was, he was, but that's just a testament to his dad and what he's done with his ball striking. He was such a good ball striker, but he would have to hit it to two feet to make a putt. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, when I have a beginner, I do the same thing because if you can't read, then you, you almost have to have a bad stroke to make a putt or yeah. bad aim or bad something to counterbalance the bad read. So I start with, I start a lot with reading and it's not necessarily aim point or vector putting or anything like that. It's, I teach them how to use their feet. I teach them how to use a level. I teach them how to use their eyes, kind of get everything calibrated. And then once it's funny because once they get into being able to actually see breaks semi correctly, the stroke actually gets better. kind of gets a little better, like without yeah. a whole lot of thought. So I start with that. And then, Obviously, you know, people do need help with their strokes. And so, you know, the technology there, we talked before we got on from Sam Putt Lab. I bought a Quintic ball roll machine, which is, I think it's going to really change how my players putt because now um, they're understanding their acceleration profile. And when they do read a putt, how much they accelerate or decelerate or stay constant affects the break. And then obviously the launch of the ball, the side spin of the ball, the rifle spin of the ball, the back spin of the ball, all has a place to play and how the ball comes off. And if it, and, and again, like I said, whether or not it affects their read or their start line. So, um, and then there's blast. I mean, I use blast still, um, but I was wrong with the blast from originally trying to eliminate a variable and saying, okay, well, if I can eliminate this variable and make sure players are at a two to one ratio, that's one less thing that they have to try and control. But then using the blast and the Quintic together, I was seeing that acceleration profiles from different distances was really affecting their ball speeds. And so that it's, it's been, it's been interesting. Yeah. So um, obviously you, you make uh, I mean, technology plays a big role in, in your in your teaching, unlike, say, like a Dave Stockton. Who, <laughs> it, it, it's all that touch and feel and stuff. Yeah. And, and it's interesting that you say where you start re with reading greens. I mean, from uh, and, and, and that's really interesting to hear and, and makes a lot of sense, actually, rather than because I like a lot of us, I think we start with you know, breaking down that, uh, uh, the stroke first. Right. But, but you're right. If, if they can't, if they can't have the most perfect stroke, but they can't read a green or understand that, then you, you have to make a bad stroke to do that. So, um, that's good to hear. So, you know, go with that Quintech and, and see, I, I know, uh, I'd like to hear, cause I, I haven't seen any of the Quintech I've seen the Sam putting lab and what's the important parts and the information to take out of that, um, uh, that mach that technology. Yeah, so um, – And, and we, why is it different from, like, the Sam's putting? Because that's what I hear. Yeah, so Sam is all about club data in, in three dimensions, right? So the Quintic does um, path and it does face of the golf club. But really what it's measuring, it's measuring the ball. So for the longest time, Carl had taught me to put a cross on the ball. I got a ball here. Yeah. Um, so to put a cross on the ball, this one just has a line, but if you can imagine a, another line perpendicular to this one, um, and then put it on the ground and film it and see if the ball launches and, or see how it rolls, or if you're hitting the ball into the ground and it's making it hop. Um, so this, the Quintic 
films in super, super high speed. Um, and so, you know, what I'm learning now and, uh, you know, trying to learn every day, but what I'm learning now is how, how much it affects, how much it affects the ball when it comes out of a nest. So the ball weighs what one and six quarter ounces or something like that. It's, it, it's not very heavy. Um, but it, 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 it's heavier than grass. So that, so obviously when the ball sits down for what Callaway figured out was for 15 seconds, if the ball is fi- sitting in one spot for 15 seconds, it's going to create its own nest. And so when the ball is struck, if you don't have enough loft, it'll hit the edge of the nest and hop. And not only will it hop, it'll leave with overspin. So now when it hits the ground, it's going to hit with, and, and skip and, and until it winds up coming to true roll. And so then the opposite, if you have too much loft, you'll launch it out of the nest and it might have backspin. And so if it has backspin, the ball is going to lose energy really, really fast. You wouldn't, you really wouldn't believe it in, unless you saw it on the machine. And, and so now all of a sudden these variables of how you're launching the ball. And I always thought putters were made with too much loft. Um, Scotty makes all his with four degrees of loft come, come to find out that's probably a pretty good place to start for everybody. But if you get somebody that leans the shaft really far forward and we can measure that, I mean, this putt right here behind me, Xander's leaving, leaning the shaft 0.64 degrees at impact and his angle of attack is up 1.33 degrees. Well, his launch angle is 1.85 degrees. And what we've seen on really good greens, I'm talking tour greens. So the stimp is, let's call it 12, and it's pretty firm. That's like optimal launch conditions for the tour. But those are terrible launch conditions for the everyday player. Um, if, it's, if you're putting on nine, nine and a half, and it's fuzzy, and that ball's sitting down, and you're launching it like that, you've got zero chance of controlling your speed. It's and, and. When the if the face is closed or open, and the ball hits the edge of the nest, it's really going to create side spin, which when the ball is launched will ultimately, I didn't know the ball could do this, <laughs> will turn into rifle spin, and so if you if if you go buy a uh, a rubber bouncy ball out of a vending machine, and you spin it backwards, when it hits the ground, it actually jumps the opposite way like a lacrosse ball. And so now you've got this ball bouncing, you know, this way and that way because of rifle spin until it attains true roll. And true roll happens at different times for everybody, depending on the, the length of the putt. So it's information that's out there. I had to pay 20000 to get it. But <laughs> if you really want to if you really want to get into the technique and what the ball is actually doing. This is the machine to do it. So with all with with a lot of us that uh, don't have that twenty grand to invest, are there? Neither do I. My wife almost killed me. <laughs> <laughs> now for us and 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 working with is are there drills or stuff that you can actually see with your eyes that you can tell these things are happening? Yeah. So the biggest thing that I've noticed is so in every metric that's th- that we're measuring here. Um, from, from launch angle to forward backspin, hook spin, start of forward rotation, face rotation, closing, opening, whatever, uh, centeredness of contact and how the face twists. And there's, and there's gear effect on a putter just as much as there is on a driver. Um, the biggest thing that I've seen, and anybody can do this in terms of video and yeah. just regular speed, take your phone out. The best players are either 50, 50 says, cause I was always told accelerate through the putt. And so, you know, 40% of the stroke is the backswing, 60% of this is the forward swing. What you see with good lag putters, and, and most of our students are awful lag putters. If they just lag put a little better, they would lower their handicap by four or five shots. You know, a couple shots on the front, a couple shots on the back, just by not three putting so much. Yes. And, and then, you know, God forbid a 25 footer goes in because you have good pay, pace, you know what I mean? So the bit, the biggest thing that I've seen and I've been watching since I've learned this um, and, and actually you look at Jamie Mulligan's guy, um, Cantlay, who 
I mean, if somebody is in cruise control when they're hitting a putt, it's that guy. I mean, Xander and I watch him all the time is their follow throughs are actually shorter than their backswings. Yeah. So, that's... so there is a little bit of a slowing down and then there's a collision. So when the putter hits the ball, there's a collision. And if you're accelerating too much, the, the putter isn't losing enough percentage of the speed. And so, and all the robot data and the data that, um, the, the inventor of this machine has from all these tour players, he's seeing anywhere from 18% to 22% drop of club head speed at strike. And then the putter accelerates again until it finally slows, slows down and stops. But seeing 50, 50 stroke and, or a shorter follow through than a, than a backswing is, is that was really kind of an eye opener to me. Yeah, when you when you spoke at the uh, the, the summit in two thousand eight, our second one at your place, yeah. I mean, that yeah, was yeah. really uh, great stuff. Where you showed the type of drills, um, and like I said, when you do that kind of a shorter follow through, a lot of my students uh, that do that feels like it's a, like a pop stroke, right? It feels like uh, you're 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 um, you're there's actually seems to be more acceleration when, when that part happens rather than you see that short uh, backswing and then the push uh, all the way through because you're trying to, quote, accelerate. So, um, again, so is there is there some specific uh, drills? I know you, you do a lot on on the putting green with, with with tools and stuff as far as lag putting as you said what what is your what is your best drill that we could all try to do as far as tip goes with uh, helping with that control of speed that you like to do personally your favorite tip or your favorite drills yeah so to know how fast the putter's actually moving is huge it's hard to it's hard to get that information there's not really anything out there um aside from blast that you can easily move around and, and kind of um, understand how fast, not only the, the, the putter is moving, but that the ball, because the putter can move consistently, you know, say for a, a 10 foot putt, um, let's call it level. The putter should be moving at center strike, middle, middle from heel to toe, good attack angle, good launch, good everything. The ball is going to go around 10 feet if the ball is moving around I'm saying on tour greens four and a half miles an hour. So then the putter needs to move two and a half miles an hour and change somewhere in between there. But that's hard. Again, that's hard information to have. So if you're doing ladder drills yeah. and you're making sure that the putter is and the, and that the ratio is the same. So again, like I was saying earlier, I thought it was a two to one ratio on the blast at 0.6 seconds backswing, 0.3 seconds forward swing, or if you're using a metronome and you've got it set at something that's comfortable for you, it might feel really, really slow from three or four feet, and it might be feel really, really fast from 50 feet. So what I've seen is those distances, you might need to build a feel for each one of those distances and maybe you just do 10 feet 20 feet because our students you know my members that i teach they work like they're not they're not tour players so they don't have a lot of time to go out and putt for two or three hours every day to create this kind of system that they can use so putting flat not uphill not downhill if you can find it from 15 feet 25 35 45 and gauging your speed that way and then the the one that we really really like is uphill and downhill is leapfrog as i don't know if everybody's heard of leapfrog but i'll just explain it so we'll do every tour event that we go to we'll put uphill and we'll start at let's say the first the first marker is at let's call it 15 feet and we're trying to get that first ball past that first marker by the smallest of margins and every ball success successive after that needs to get past the one previous so you're just going one ball the next ball goes farther and let's say you have 15 feet of of space to work with and as soon as that last ball goes too far the game is over so you're trying to get as many balls into that space as possible 
and then do it downhill, which is exponentially harder. I mean, so if, if you go out this afternoon and you go to the golf course and you try and do it, like in 15 feet, your first attempt, you might get four or five balls. But your fifth attempt, you might get 17 balls. And then, you know, as your students start getting better at this and they go, wow, I actually hit it between 15 to 25, 35 feet, 45 feet my pace is really good. I might have a chance to actually make one and then, and then really kind of limit the, the, the three putting. Right. That's good. Uh, I got, I got one, one more question for you and then, then hopefully um, everybody uh, please chime in here uh, as far as questions for Derek. Um, you know, obviously when, when you're feeling good and everybody knows this, when it feels good, you have a nice feel for the pace and everything's fine and dandy and it's fun. But what, what do you tell your, your students when they're actually out there uh, when it doesn't feel good? You know, what, what's the first thing or process or, or fallback, if you will, say like, okay, so I'm struggling with the feel, but I'm on the, I'm on the, <laughs> I'm on the golf course playing. Are there certain things that you do when they don't feel good and you tell them, okay, let's do this. What would that be? Yeah. So, I mean, that happens all the time. <laughs> yeah. It happens more often than not. Right. Yes. So um, one of the things that I'll do is I'll tell them like, okay, well, what's the pattern? Because there's going to be a pattern. And so Xander's been playing, he's played, 12 out of the last 14 days because he's getting ready and he's having money games and he's been playing with Phil and Charlie and Brendan Steele a lot. And, and one of the days he's been, and he's been, he's, he, I think he's got a siphon in Mickelson's account right now. <laughs> he's just <laughs> taking all of his cash. But on Sunday he didn't, he couldn't make anything, but it was like this weird day and he was trying to figure it out. So afterwards he called me and he was like, He's like, man, I, we need to, we need to putt. We need to putt. Cause it was unacceptable for him. Yeah. And I said, okay, well, what's the pattern? What, what, do you, what were you doing? And so, you know, and the questions I was asking him is like, okay, well, what was happening on the right to lefters? What was happening on the left to writers? And come to find out he was under reading. His vision has shifted somehow. His, all of his left to writers were high, his reads yeah. and all of his right to lefters were low. So, I started talking to him about it. It's like, look, when you're in the middle of the, of, of the heat in battle, if you start seeing some of these misses, you got to identify it like right away. Hey, that one was low. Oh my God. I hit another right to left and it missed low, but I know my ball starts where I'm aiming my putter. So it has to be read. It has to be, you have to be able to break it down. So I have a spreadsheet that I give players and they fill out every single putt that they hit from the distance what break it was was it uphill downhill and so you know over the course of let's say four or five rounds they're going to see a pattern 100 percent. so then what he'll do is he'll go in the middle of a round if he's having a problem he'll go and stand where a putt is perfectly straight where he thinks it's perfectly straight from let's call it six or eight feet and he'll just stare at it because, because now it's like, okay, well, if I kind of know what straight looks like and I'm misreading my right to lefters or I'm misreading my left to righters, I've got, at least I've got a baseline because the reason why his stroke and most people's strokes feel terrible is because their reads are so bad that they'll hit, they'll go, oh, this is a ball outside left when it's three cups and they feel like they push it, but they didn't, it just broke way more than they thought. So the stroke feels crappy. And so then now they get a baseline and they can kind of work everything off that baseline. So it comes back down again, like you say, to reading, right? So they're, they're trying to see again, what is straight and yeah. goes from reading and then works its way back to, to the, 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 the stroke there or, or yeah. the technique. And, and I don't care how you read it. You could do aim point. Don't care. You can do vector. Don't care. You can do Robert Grover's putting trajectory. I don't care. You can use your eyes. You can, I don't care as long as it's right. And as long as you can hit it there at the right speed, that's all I care about. I don't care. I listen, if, if, if you have a player and their path is a little funky and you're like, well, we can fix that, but they're starting their ball online. I'm like, okay, what's our goals here? Because if you're starting your ball online and all we need to do is read it a little bit better 
And yeah, if the launch conditions of the ball are a little funky, I mean, we got to be very, very careful which road we take this player down because all of a sudden, if you start fixing their stroke and they can't start it online, they're going to start changing their reads. It's going to, it's like this avalanche of stuff that can start happening. So we got to be super, super careful. Great stuff. Um, Anthony, you got any, I I saw some uh, uh, questions coming up. Yeah, I got a, I got a question um, and then I'll read out a few of these, Derek. Um, my question is, you know, you, you referred to it as with Xander in regards to um, reading pods, right? That's kind of the missing or the or the, the difficult variable to identify. Um, and, you know, obviously Xander's a great player. Give me an example of what you see with most players. You know, what determines a misread? Is there anything that kind of pops out to you? So... I would say 95%, and this includes tour players. I would say 95% of the people I see will misread low, especially downhill, but they play high. So those are the players that you'll see and you'll hear, man, I made everything today. God, the, the, the hole looked like the ocean and I'm standing on the beach, man. Like I'm just hooping everything. And then the next day, they don't make anything. Man, I couldn't buy the next week, the next month, they can't make a putt because they were lucky to begin with that one day. So to me, skill is I know where to hit it. I can aim there and I can hit it there. Yeah, some people get good feel one day and they misread low, but they're just they're just aiming just high enough to start it a little higher than what they thought. And they make a few that day, more than a few that week that month, but that goes away over time. That goes away. Xander's rookie year on the PGA tour. He won the tour championship on a golf course. He'd never seen before because he knows what slope looks like and he knew how to play it. So super fast greens at Augusta. We finished second last year. We missed seven putts. We lipped out seven putts on Thursday and Friday because of our speed. But now that we know what we're doing, it's, it's going to be a different story moving forward. But, the amateurs, they, if you, if they can't listen, if I have a perfect stroke, perfect aim, perfect contact, perfect, perfect, everything, the 10 commandments of putting is what I call it. But the one is wrong, which is the most important one read. I will miss 100% of my putts. If everything else is perfect, but my read, you know, if the green's good enough to, to let the ball do what, what you wanted it to do. So when I go back and I, t- you know, look at what a good read is, I have a spectrum. So within that spectrum, there's a high line and there's a low line. Now my low line is not going to be six feet past. My firm line is going to be two feet past. And my die line is kind of dripping side door, right? So if I have that spectrum and you can tell your students like, look, I can make it on any one of these lines as long as I hit it, match the speed to that, I can make this putt. There's not just one line. There's several. So to say, to say there's a, a, a right or a wrong read, and it depends on how they putt. I mean, I watched John Rahm for 36 holes on Monday, and, man, that guy is aggressive. But why would you change it? He's the number two player in the world, and he freaking hoops. Yeah. So, so I don't know if I answered your question completely, but. Yeah, I and uh, just one last question. How do you prescribe cra- practice? Meaning, um, you know, for me personally, I, you know, if I'm playing golf, I'm trying not to think about my stroke at all, right? I'm, I'm just aiming the putter and trying to hit the ball where I'm aiming. Yeah. I, I, you know, do you, do you block practice as far as the technicals go and then maybe a block for speed? And then, you know, how does that translate to the golf course? Yeah, that's exactly right. So I always go back to full swing. The problem with putting is you don't get any feedback. So if I hit a seven iron and the face is closed relative to the path, the ball is going to hook, right? Or the exact opposite, face open relative to the path, the ball is going to slice. And then me as a player, I can look at the ball flight and go, well, okay, I had to have done one of two things maybe. Maybe my path was too far left or my face was too open. Let's let's just say that. But with putting – the ball's just rolling, and, and then when you hit it, 
you know, maybe you might not look up so soon and, or maybe your feedback is wrong. Like, Oh, that felt like I, this girl this morning, she said she was pulling putts and I'm watching her. I'm like, no, you're not pulling putts. You're just aimed left. You're aimed left of where you think you're aimed. So she diagnosed herself incorrectly. And if you start doing that, man, that's a rabbit hole. Nobody wants to go down because that, that that's really tough. So that's why we came up with these putting plates. So the Dave Pell's plate, that black one with the marbles, I, I was like, oh, man, this is right up my alley. I need to aim this thing, you know, where I want this ball to start. And then this ball is going to roll through this gate. And if it hits the gate, I know I didn't start it online. Boom, I got it. But the problem is that the reservoir that the ball sits in, I filmed it with my Casio camera at 600 frames per second. I hit a 15 footer and the ball flew over the marbles. <laughs> and so immediately I was like, I can't, I can't use this product. I, and then, you know, it was too thick and it sits on top of the, on top of the grass. And then once, if it did come out of there and it hit the ground, now it's hopping. So we, we created this thing where you could anchor it down to the level of the grass and then the, the reservoir that the ball sits in is really, really shallow so it doesn't hop but you don't even need that you could just put two t's you can put a sharpie mark on the ground and say okay this is where my ball is going to be and i'm going to put it in the same spot every time until i get too much of a of a nest that the ball sits in and then you can fork it you know with a with a t or a divot tool fixer and tap it down so there's not a nest but if you can get your ball on your target and you can do it on left to right right to left straight doesn't matter so that's the block practice and the feedback. So I'll have players set up a station, and that's why we sell the plates in sets of three. I can set up a right to left, left to right, straight. Block practice, block practice, block practice. Now I go randomize. Random, random, random. Come back to block. Block, 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 block for a couple minutes. Go randomize for 10. Block, block, block for a few minutes. Go randomize because I like random. I think random is better than, better than block. I'd take random in over block any day of the week unless i had a severe flaw that i had to change and then then i would have to do some some block so after, um, oh, i'm sorry just on what you just said right there after the block and the random you know like we had uh, brady brady uh riggs on talking about his game that he plays his favorite game yeah. uh the the, the 1.3 point so you know that's great what what game do you like uh, after you do the random and it gets you into that uh, type of mental or, or, or competitive mode? Yeah, so yeah. this is so I, we were talking about how good Sean Cox is, my director of golf. Um, yeah. We've created an atmosphere and a culture at the Grand where there are a lot of good playing members from Emiliano Grio, who I work with, who that guy is going to do some special things pretty soon when he starts to get this putting thing figured out from Xander to Charlie, to Phil, to all these mini tour guys, Nehu Mendoza, who was a Palmer cup player who's now turned professional and some of these other college guys that are turned professional. And so we have this game that we play and we call it the point game. And so it's, a, it's extremely competitive. I mean, guys are arguing all day for a point and the, the denominations can be whatever it is. It's, you know, Charlie and Xander will play a hundred dollars a point and there's a maximum of six points per putt. Um, so, and, but the other guys don't have that kind of dough, So they play a dollar a point, which still adds up. I mean, if, if there's three or four guys playing in a game and you get a zero and everybody else gets a six, do the math. That's one putt. So, so you get a point for aiming correctly. And we all have to stand behind this player to see if they're aiming correctly. And we don't say anything, but after the putt, we, we will measure it. You get a point for starting it on your target line. You get a point for hitting it in the center of the club face. If we all believe that the read is correct, whether you miss it or, or not, or make it, and then you get two points for making it, because that's the most important thing. Like, so we'll do four footers, six footers. We might stretch it out to 10, 12 feet. It's kind of hard to see, but that's a game that I think, and it's all random. So I'll pick the putt and everybody will watch. And then the next guy will have a total, completely, totally different putt. And then we'll watch and we'll mark everything down on paper to see who has the most points at the end. And then it's time to break out either Venmo, Venmo or cash. <laughs> so what, what was that again? It was line. So aim, you get aim. a point for aiming correctly. So some of these guys have these dots on their putters and it's like, you should hear the arguments come out when there's no line on the back of the putter. 
Like, no, bullshit. You were aimed to the left or you were aimed to the right. No, I'm not giving you that point. And it's just argument. And now I'm the, I'm the guy that comes in and says yes or no. And then they either get pissed at me, but I, I got to be the judge and jury and executioner on that one. So it's aim, centeredness, centeredness, of, centeredness of contact. Yeah. Whether or not the ball starts online, because we're yeah. all standing back there watching this. Right. So if it starts and this is another one, it'll be like, man, that ball looked like it started like a quarter of a ball offline. And if everybody agrees, the player doesn't get that point. Like it needs to split the target. So we use a T. We just put a T in the ground or use another golf ball, set a golf ball out there as the as the target. And then the read, did they place that ball or that T where that read is, whether it's high read, low read, you know, or somewhere in between, and then obviously the make. And it's, so it's, and we've toyed with putting other, other, you know, categories in there, but this one's, this is, this is pretty good. And it, and man, I'll tell you, you get your juniors doing it. And it's like, you could do it for club cleaning. Hey, if I have the most points, you guys are cleaning my clubs or the guy with the lowest amount of points is cleaning everybody's clubs. And Hey, I want you to use a T and dig all that dirt out of my grooves. <laughs> like it gets brutal, man. So yeah, cool. but it, that's a really, really good one. Thanks. Hey, Derek, we had a great uh, question from Tim. Um, last week we had a, our chat was about eye dominance. Um, uh, great question from Tim. Um, do you use eye dominance as one of the components you have to match up for your players? Meaning, um, is there anything you teach maybe different for a player who's right uh, eye dominant or left eye dominant? For sure. So um, that's a great question. So just tell a story ben when ben crane first came out on tour we were looking for a caddy and so we did we did stuff out on the putting green this is with carl welty when carl was working with with ben and not a lot of people know that carl was the one that got ben out there um so we were looking for a caddy and we were we started with a perfectly straight putt and so we would bring these guys in and we leveled it out with a digital level it was zero and somebody would look at it and go oh yeah that's a ball outside left you know, say it's from 10 or 15 feet. Next guy would come in and, oh, that's inside right or that's outside right. And then and then Brett Waldman was the guy that we found who ultimately wound up catting for um, for Charlie for a while and now works for uh, Zach Johnson. He came in. He's like, what are you guys talking about? This is straight. And so then we started messing around with pool tables and, and tilting pool tables and seeing if he could guess what the actual reading was on the digital level. Come to find out he was left eye dominant. And so he said that, you know, originally when I would look at a perfectly straight putt being left eye dominant for whatever reason, it looked like it was right to left and right eye dominant sees, sees a straight putt as left to right. And I've seen that over the last 25 or so years of teaching that has been really consistent. Occasionally you'll find an outlier that goes, oh, that's the other way. But most people don't even know what eye dominant they are. So that, that was a really, really big one. The other big one was, I think the line on the ball is cheating. I think that it's a training aid. I think it's, it's a huge advantage if you're really good at reading greens. Now, if you're not good at reading greens and you line up your line really well, obviously you're at a disadvantage because now you're aiming everything at the wrong spot. But so Emiliano Grillo is right eye dominant. And so what I told him was, uh, let me see. So, so I told him, I said, you, what you want to do. So if I'm, let's say I'm a foot and a half to two feet away from my ball and I'm squatting down and I've got this line and I'm lining it up like this. So I got the line there and I'm lining it up. Well, my eyes are looking across this ball, right? I'm not a cyclops. So I've got an eye here and an eye here and I'm trying to converge my eyes to a point which is where the ball is. But my dominant eye is going to tell me where that line is lined up. So what I figured out, um, uh, maybe it was a few years ago, that if I could tell that person to just go take their hand and put it right on their nose and turn so that their dominant eye is there, so it's like shooting a gun, right? So if I could take them and go like this, and now they're, I'm left eye dominant, and now take their eye 
and their ball and get it down that line, they're way better at lining up the ball. It's not even close. It's incredible how much better they are when you simply just get your player if they if they want to use a line on the ball. Because most people, they get the ball, they line it up, and they get behind it, and it's not correct, and they walk back in, and they get over, and they and it's like it takes them five minutes to get the freaking ball lined up. It's like, dude, like let's let's go. So, and then the other part of that is extending their arm as far as they possibly can, because most people kind of squat and then they they get right on top of the ball. But if you get farther away, squat four or five feet away and ex- really extend your arm. And I didn't realize that until I started working with Charlie. And I noticed that Xander was doing the same thing. And it, this was like a year ago. I'm like, that makes so much sense. Like if I have the ball farther away from me, I can see not only down my arm and down the line of the ball, I can see towards my target better. I'm not looking at the ball and then looking up and looking at the ball and then looking up and looking at the ball and looking up and making these small adjustments. But yeah, the eye dominance. And then when you're lining it up or some people take a shaft and they look at it. But again, if, if you don't turn your dominant eye to the middle of your face or the, you know, the middle of your head like this and become a Cyclops, it's hard to kind of get that line lined up with the shaft. I, I, you see people do that all the time on tour. Yeah, that's great stuff. I don't know if that helps, but yeah. So, so essentially, what you're saying is a lot of the work is really just coming even prior to setup, and it really doesn't affect your setup. It's it's all in the pre-shot and how you're put, putting the ball down, and um, you know, reading from behind with your dominant yeah. eye. And I I just call all of this like being calibrated. If 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 you know what straight looks like, you're gonna know what right to left and left to right looks like, right? If you know you can lean, line your ball up correctly, quickly, you're in good shape, right? That's that all is pretty easy. I got I'm in my garage right now, and the door's open, so it's I got the garbage guys coming. You're all good. You're all good. Sorry hey, I had a question about in in um, about kind of de deattaching or unattaching expectation with your putting. You know, Brad Faxon talks a lot about that. She says, you know, her. Confidence maybe is a little bit lost, and she feels like she's expected to to make putts. Um, would you mind maybe taking us through how you're working with your players to detach the uh, uh, outcome? I think the biggest thing for players to understand. So we all probably have some really good juniors that we teach, right? Every PGA member in in Southern California probably has some good juniors that play tournament golf, and 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 then again, they don't play on perfect greens. Like if you've walked the greens at Tory normally. Poana, Bumpy, you know, whatever. So the biggest thing that I tell my players, number one, putting is really, really hard. And you're in control of very little. Like once that ball hits the putter, you could hit. So in Mexico, Xander's ball striking, he was like plus five strokes gain ball striking in Mexico. And the greens are like nine and shaggy and bumpy and if they didn't have it that way the golf course wouldn't exist because the grass wouldn't survive if they shaved it down and here he is with optimal launch conditions for perfect greens and he can't we didn't have a different putter for him he couldn't control he's feeling like he's hitting a 20-foot putt 30 feet It, it was out of his control and he was getting frustrated 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 and come to find out i told him i'm like dude when you're when you're putting on the West Coast on Poana, good luck. A lot of it is on the lucky bounce. And then you have Adam Scott, that's the exact opposite. He's like, man, I love Riv because the greens level out the playing field and I'm not that good of a putter. But I know some people are going to get unlucky and some people are going to get lucky. And so if you can convince your students, like, look, we're going to do everything we can before the strike, before the collision. But after that collision, if you get unlucky, it is, that part is what it is, you know? So if they're just trying to go through their process, I use that word a lot, just go through your process, get yourself in the right mind frame to just hit the best shot you can at the moment. And sometimes that process is freaking hard. You know, it's, it's tough, especially when there's, a hole in the boat and the water is doing this and you're going down like, yeah, that makes it tough. But if you can try and, and understand, like, this is an imperfect surface. I'm not putting on glass. Okay. 
I'm good. I'm, I'm going to be good with the outcome. And, and so that's, is that, Derek, is that the same thing, you know, working with a, maybe a player who's slumping a little bit or, or, you know, has lost a, a bit of confidence? Are you, are you changing that practice routine and maybe putting them closer to the hole so they can see the ball going, going in the hole? Yeah. I mean, I, so Charlie hasn't putted well in probably a year and a half and he's, he's, Focusing on shortening up his stroke, lengthening his stroke, changing his posture, changing putters and all this. Um, Whatever, I will say this, whatever is going to change that player's attitude, and that's one of my 10 commandments is attitude. It's, it's, I don't care if he changes putters. I don't care if he changes his setup. Because ultimately, he knows what he's doing and he's going to break out of it unless he's changing 10 variables at once. Now we have no clue what the hell's going on, right? So it's measurement. It's finding whatever you want to use. The video camera, if you want to use Blast, if you want to use that Capto device. I don't know if you guys have heard of Capto. It's basically, it's it's a more uh, mobile SAM putt lab. So it's a kind of a heavy thing that sits on the on the shaft of the putter, which I don't like. But it's cheaper. It's like twenty four hundred bucks. Not that that's cheap. It's not. It's cheaper. Um, So so, you know, with again with Charlie, it's it's amazing because we talk about attitude all the time, and I always tell him, your play should never determine your attitude, ever, whether it's good or bad. Your attitude should always be the catalyst for good play, and so he's 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 also been on tour for. 15 years so you know he knows what he's doing josh asked if you wouldn't mind sharing your 10 commandments with us Ah, let's see if i can remember them all so aim right aim is a biggie well read aim starting the ball online centeredness of contact the tempo to me is important and controlling your ball speed having your eyes calibrated the role the at your attitude See, I always miss one. I'll come. I'll. I'll. I'll think of it. Th- those fact, are pretty. You good. know what I, I'll do is I'll. I'll. Uh, um, Randy, maybe what I'll do is I'll. Uh, I'll text it to you, and then you can send it out to the membership if they're or whoever's on the chat, and uh, we'll penalize everybody else for not going on the chat. <laughs> yeah, that'd be great. Yeah, no yeah. problem. Any other questions out there? While the questions are kind of coming up, uh, why don't you uh, share with us your little event that you had at, at your place that uh, Sean Cox put on? Yeah, like I said, um, I mean, I know everybody out there is great. There's a lot of really good pros out there, but I feel like I have the best pro around. You know, he's uh, – I talked to him a lot, you know, when we were shut down. And every time we talked, he was so concerned to tears almost about what was happening to his staff from the pros to the bag room guys, to the driving range guys, to the caddies, to the food and beverage, to the, to the locker room. I mean, he was just like, what, are, what am I going to, how can I, you know, cause we furloughed everybody. Right. So they weren't getting paid. Some of them weren't getting their checks right away like everybody else. And so he said, you know, do you think Xander, Charlie, and Emmy would would play, you know, to help raise money for for the for the outside staff? Absolutely. Charlie's gonna do it. Xander for sure would do it. He's one of the best guys on the planet. Um, and Emmy, you know, he he just loves playing golf. So um John Rahm comes around a lot. He practices a lot. He's friends with Alberto Sanchez, who played. He was his roommate at Arizona State, who's one of our members. That's uh, Latino America status, um, one of my guys. And um, so he comes when Arizona's hot. He comes into San Diego and, you know, as, as just not just for John, for for everybody. He rolls out the red carpet. You know, it's 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 um, so he asked he asked everybody, hey, would you guys do an event where we can sell golf cars? 
um, you know, for a thousand dollars and, and just let the members know that it's a, that it's a donation to outside services. So they played 54 holes and we had a minimum of 10 carts, um, per 18 holes. So if you paid for the first 18, you got to go walk on the greens. I mean, stand, you know, six feet away or 10 feet away from guys hitting shots. And it was incredible. So Charlie's wrist was kind of sore. So, um, Christy Kerr took his spot in the second 18 and then Xander's back was sore. So he only played 36. So we had Shane French, who's one of our members who's on a um, scholarship at USC next year, who shot 67 on John and Emiliano. And another guy who played at USC is one of my guys, Danny Ochoa. And um, it was just incredible. I mean, we had an auction. There was a Jack Nicholas president's cup flag. Xander signed a bunch of stuff. Charlie, Christy Kerr bought her, brought her wine. I mean, it was, they raised quite a bit of money for the staff and that's, that's just Sean, man. I mean, he's the guy's the best. He, uh, you know, he's, he's incredible. So we're lucky. We're so lucky to have him in our chapter. And then ultimately in the section, I mean, the guy is just, I can't say enough good things about the guy. I agree. A uh, couple more questions popped up real quick and then uh, we'll wrap this up. Anthony, did you get those? Sorry, I was muted there. Um, looks like we had a question from Josh about the fall line and how much that kind of comes into finding the fall line and maybe um, into reading. And then uh, maybe along the same lines, Deb asks, uh, what do you think of aim point? Is it maybe, maybe a question about a specific way to read putts or system that you use? Yeah, so, okay, so start with the fall line. So let's say we got a planar surface. I'm trying to find zero, which is basically aim point, right? If I know the speed of the greens. So this is a drill that everybody can do um, as well. Um, if, you can, if you can find a relatively planar surface, just a flat, tilted surface, and let's just say you start with a six-foot putt. And you identify, let's say you identify that with a digital level and you find zero, zero going uphill, zero going downhill. So on a planar surface, that is going to match downhill and uphill. There's going to be a point above the hole on the line of the straight putt. That's going to be a really good read. Not, not going to be perfect, but it's going to be really close to every single putt around that hole as long as it's the same distance and as long as the speed travels, the ball travels past the hole about the same distance. Okay. So if I find the straight putt, if I've got, um, I'll just use this. So I got this green and this green is tilted, right? So this is uphill. This is downhill. I'm going to go to, you know, three o'clock ish or nine o'clock ish. And I'm going to read this putt and put a tee in the ground above the hole where I think I should start this putt. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to walk around the entire hole, left to right, right to left, uphill, downhill. I'm going to walk around the hole and I'm going to scan with my arm out and look at that putt and see if that looks like it's the correct read for every single one of those putts. And if it is, no matter where my ball is, that's what I'm going towards. And that's aim point. So Dr. Grober, taught me that um so ultimately it's math and he had this program on his computer and he was tilting the screen and he's like let's see you know if it, if it and he's showing me all this math and i didn't get the math but then when we put it into practice i was like this this is impossible there's no way that this can be true but what you what ultimately what you'll do is you put a bunch of bunch of coins or ball markers or t's around the hole and then you can take a string line and stick it in the ground where your read is and put it to any one of those and hit it down that string line. And I'll be damned if it's not perfect. It's real. That's a really, really good one. So then when you tell your players, Hey, when you get on the green, find where the straight putt is, find where your ball is relative to that. Look at a spot above the hole, figure that boom, you're done. You can do it in 12 seconds. The read could be that fast. Hey Derek, can we plug your plates there? Is there a place where we can buy your plates or uh, find out any of your product info? Yeah, actually, so I told the guy that makes them, um, anybody that is on the the um, chat that wants to buy them, um, 
we'll do like a SCPGA Pro, SCPGA PRO in the um, coupon. I guess, yeah, it's like a coupon thing. I, I I don't really know, but it's puttingplates.com and just type in SCPGA PRO and you'll get a discount. And I told him to give him more than 10% discount. So I, I don't know if it's exactly set up yet, but um, hopefully by lunchtime, he'll have it, he'll have it set up. And there's, awesome. there's all kinds of things. This one is happens to be the indoor one where it's pretty heavy and it's a little thicker. Um, so you can move it around inside. And, and that one was the one that my, my, and my daughter using that during this whole thing. And, and, you know, as long as you know where you're aiming and the ball's starting where you're aiming, that's it's feedback. Right. So, and then the plates and the, and the, the little holes targets and all mirrors and whatnot, it's, it should be all on there. Have you yeah. seen Dean's uh, putting? Uh, it's like a rubber band. Um, are, are you familiar with, with his, uh, what do you, yes, what do you I am. Uh, the first time I used it, I haven't, I've only used it the once. And I'm not sure I know exactly how to use it. Charlie had it. And Charlie, it was, um, Dean was giving them out um, during the GOAT, the thing at the GOAT where Dave Emmerich was. Um, and we had one and we were messing around with it. Actually, we messed around a little bit at Tory too, because you've got opposing forces on both sides. And then once you get off of it, it's like, whoa, the putter, the putter mm -hmm. felt uh, super light to me. And it was like, I, I kind of wanted to get it going back in both directions. But the funny thing about it is Dr. Grover talks about resonance and how, let's say you were going to jump. You wouldn't squat down really, really slow and then jump as high as you could. And then you wouldn't squat down really, really fast and try and jump as high as you could. There would be a rhythm to how you squat down and jump. And that's the same thing that should happen in a golf swing to create leverage and ground force and shear force. And it's the same thing in a putting stroke you don't want to take the putter back really, really slow because then all of a sudden you have, there's the acceleration profile again or really, really fast and then decel. So there has to be some type of rhythm, some type of, of spring to get the putter back to then move it forward. And, and that to me, that kind of helped me get that, that feel. Hey Derek, uh, on behalf of the, the the teaching committee and obviously our, our our section members and everyone's on the call, thank you so much for taking the time and sharing all this cool stuff. Uh, like I said, we we got to see uh, firsthand at, at the summit that that you, that you did, and uh, I, I'm glad that you're able to to come on and share all this great information. Yeah, my pleasure. Um, you know, Jeff Johnson was my mentor growing up at Steel Canyon and. You know, if I if I don't do do right by him and just try and grow our business and help our brothers and sisters in the PGA, then I, I, I'd be hearing it from Jeff. I can tell you that. But yeah, yeah. no, I mean, with his help and his guidance, I, I anytime anybody needs anything, my my phone lines are open. My door is open. Appreciate that. Anthony, you got anything to close off? Yeah, I just wanted to remind everyone. Um, if if you get a few minutes, please uh, take a take a minute to fill out our survey. The uh, the the link is attached there. It really helps us kind of figure out what we're going to present for you, and and we want this to be an open discussion and a collaborative event for everyone. Um, lastly, uh, just wanted to remind everyone you got a few days left to uh, finish your specialization. Um, so if you haven't done that, you know it's it's free of charge. Uh, but I believe it's the end of May, so um, do that. And then last, last thing is uh, PGA, uh, so get EDM certified. This is going to be the first step. And, um, you know, PGA is, is uh, rolling out a directory. Um, it's it's the first step. And make sure you're in that directory. To the so make sure you're doing all those things. I appreciate everyone being here. All right. Anthony, you kind of broke up, but um... – uh, we'll have this in, I think these are all ar archives, so uh, we will be able to uh, look it over, um, you know, again, in, in the archive uh, segments. Uh, I forgot that we are going to be back next week for next week, Wednesday's chat. And then after that, we're, we're planning on doing it bi-weekly. So uh, we'll have another uh, a guest um, to be able to speak to us on getting back into golf and uh, 
lucky enough to get someone uh, as good as Derek to uh, to share some of his um, his knowledge and experience. Uh, so for everybody, everybody stay safe and um, let's get back to golf safely. Uh, we'll see you folks next week.